Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Uh, come on, it's Super Bowl Sunday. We do that. How's it going today, church? None of you are Eagles or KC fans, I take it. We're like, uh, you're all here today, so I'm assuming none of you care about the Super Bowl. Well, good morning. <laughs> my name is Tony Simeon. I'm the associate pastor here at FBC. Um, to my left, you're right. We have actually have something to celebrate this week because we have a white balloon. Now, if you're new here, and you're not sure what this means, this means that somebody gave their heart to Christ, that somebody stepped from darkness to life. And we celebrate that here. Yes, we do. So now, speaking of the game, the big game, KC, Philadelphia, I'm not a fan of either one of them. However, my team is actually close to one of them. I'm a Steelers fan, so you have Pennsylvania. So the Eagles were kind of Pennsylvania brothers. Um... But these two teams made it to the Super Bowl, okay? So they get some credit. They made it to the big show, the big game. They get to be one of the two teams where you get to go and watch a game where the commercials are actually better than the game. I mean, come on, they are. <laughs> they are. The commercials are better. But they get credit. But you see, around 6.30 or 7 o'clock tonight, one of those teams is going to get honor and glory, only one. The other one's going to go home, and nobody's going to remember them. We always remember the winners, right? But one team is going to get honor and glory, and they're going to earn it because they're going to play a game, and they're going to win, okay? And here today, in the book of Malachi, in chapter 1, verse 6, all the way through to chapter 2, verse 9, it's page 653 in your pew Bible, so if you don't have a Bible, reach in front of you, grab that pew Bible, uh, if you don't own one, take it as a gift from us. If you just want to use it for today, that's great. Um, but on page 653, uh, verses 1, chapter 1, verse 6 through 2 through 9. Okay, and it's all on the same page right there. Malachi is prophesying to the children of Israel because they're not giving God his glory. They're not giving God his due. So starting in chapter 1, Starting in verse 6, we read, A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have you defiled how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. So here, the Lord's table is being defiled. Okay? Now, the book of Malachi is interesting because it's kind of a, it, it, it reads like a conversation. So Malachi is prophesying for God. He's speaking for God, and he's telling the people of Israel what they're doing are wrong, and the people of Israel are answering back going, well, how have we? Why did we? How did we? What did we do? And God keeps answering them back. So if you read the whole book, it's an interesting read. Read the whole book. You'll see this conversation going on between them. Okay? So what happens now is by this point, God has already dealt with Israel's sin of idolatry. Okay? Having other gods before them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, they, all, they, they covered that one. Some of the other prophets, they covered that. Now there's a different sin coming, coming on. That's causing the people of Israel to stir up the anger of God, okay? And it has something to do with food and his altar, okay? God wants Israel to honor him. He even says it. Am I a father? Now, shouldn't a son honor his father? And if I'm a father, where is my honor? A master honors his slave, or a slave honors his master. Where is my honor? So God's looking for this, and he's sitting there, and then he tells him, but you have defiled my altar because you hold it in contempt. Now, the people of Israel didn't respond to God and say, well, how do we hold it in contempt? Okay? It was their actions. Okay? Let's continue on in verse 8. Okay? When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is not that wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is not that wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? 
Now plead with God, be gracious, with, be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Oh, that one of you should shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Israel's actions is not showing honor to the Lord. What's going on here is they're offering defective animals. See, you have to go to the book of Leviticus and just read verse, the first chapter. It's like 18 verses, the first chapter, okay? Leviticus, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either herd or flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect, so right off the bat, in Leviticus, when the law was given, God told them, when you bring an animal to me to sacrifice, it's got to be without blemish. It's got to be perfect. And here what was going on was, is they were bringing their sacrifices, and the priests were allowing the sacrifices to come as lame, diseased, or blind. They weren't giving God their best. It had to be perfect. You must present it at the entrance of the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord. And then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar at the entrance to the tent of meeting. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to put the fire on the altar and arrange the wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning and on the altar. You are to wash the internal, the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering of food, it is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord." So they failed to honor the Lord with this because the offerings they brought were lame and blind and diseased. They weren't giving God his best. And so God says, no, you defiled my table, my altar. And because of that, your worship, your worship of me is useless. It's pointless. I will not accept it. Matter of fact, he said it in the verse. I am not pleased with you. See, we want to give God our best. We want to do our best to give Him our best, to give Him our first, to give Him an offering acceptable to Him. Okay? And we do that with our worship. Our worship is acceptable to Him. See, no longer do we have to have sacrifices thanks to Jesus. Thanks to the work that Jesus did on the cross, we no longer have to do this. So now... Our sacrifice to him, and we'll look at this a little bit later, is our worship. How are we worshiping him? Are we worshiping, worshiping him like Israel and trading our best, not for our best, and just giving him our seconds when he's done so much for us? See, we do this when we put ourselves first. And what God wants is a relationship with you and for him to be first in your life. Now let's continue on in Malachi chapter 2. He goes from the people of Israel to the priests. Because you see, the priests were the ones who were supposed to teach the people how to do all this stuff. The priests were the ones that God gave these orders to, this is how you sacrifice. Everything I read to you from Leviticus was given to the priests. So they were supposed to be the messenger of God. And so God says, no, <laughs> watch. And now you priests, this is a warning for you. If you do not listen and if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, 
I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them, because you have not resolved to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This is called, and this called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. The priests were held accountable for not teaching the people to honor the Lord. Because you've got to remember, they were, they were his messenger. The priests were. Okay? They couldn't even read the Torah. They would go to the temple and the priests would read the Torah, would read the law to them. Okay? So the priests were the ones that gave the message. And they were doing it wrong. They dishonored the Lord by showing partiality. If you go to verse 9 in chapter 2, it says, So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated. Now let me stop right there for just a second. When he says, they be, I caused you to be despised and humiliated, if you go back to that verse, there's this one line in there where he says, I will smear on your faces the dung from your sacrifices. Now, dung does not mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean poo. It doesn't mean poo. No. It actually means all the useless stuff from the animal that is not edible or for use. So all the entrails and stuff that they never did anything with, that's the stuff that he was going to smear on their faces. And this is a metaphor for humiliating them because of what they were doing. They were not honoring the Lord. Okay? And so the reason why was because you have not followed my ways but have shown partialities in matters of the law. So in other words, these priests were supposed to be, they were, they were, actually they were not supposed to be playing favorites. So in other words, if I was like a rich landowner and I walked up to the temple and I said, hey, uh, you know, I got this really great cow who, uh, or bull that's doing a lot for me and I really don't want to, it's my best one, I really don't want to give it. So how about if I give you a couple extra, you know, five or ten pieces of gold and you just let me give this lame cow that I got right here and you offer that sacrifice to the Lord. Would that be, and the priests are like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. Yeah, we'll do that. They weren't giving God their best or their first. And they knew this. And to God, this was like a slap in the face because he told them how to do this. He gave them the law. Even in the covenant, the covenant that he talks about in verse 4 and 5 refers back to Numbers chapter 25 with, a, with the covenant that he gave to Phineas. Now, you want to read a really cool story? I'm going to give you the abridged version, but this is a really cool story because what's happening here in Numbers chapter 25 is the Israelites were intertribal mingling. In other words, God had told them, don't marry outside your tribes. And they were going and getting Midianite and Moabite wives. And God was angered, angered about this. And then one Israelite decides, I'm going to go get me a Moabite woman, and I'm going to walk her right in front of all of Israel, and I'm going to walk her right into the tent of meeting. And this one priest, who was actually named as Phineas, who was actually Aaron's grandson, sees this and just comes unglued. Because the Bible says that Phineas had zeal for the Lord. In other words, he was on fire for God. Everything about this young man was for God. And so Phineas decides to grab a spear, walks into the tent meeting, and impales both of them. That satisfied the Lord's anger. Because God had told him, don't intermingle like that. And Israel was called to be a light amongst the other nations, to be a representation of God. And because they were intermingling, what was happening was they were allowing these other gods in through marrying these other women. So when Phineas impaled these two, it satisfied God's anger. 
And God says, now you've made atonement. I mean, the Old Testament was bloody. I mean, even that first chapter of Leviticus we read, did you hear that, what they have to do with the blood? They have to go in and they sprinkle it all over the place. Thank the Lord he sent his son 2,500 years ago so that we don't have to deal with that. But they did. And it was just, blows your mind. Because Israel's worship was like a foul stench to God now. They were doing it wrong. And in Malachi, the priests were supposed to have zeal like Phineas. Now, I don't think they wanted him going around stabbing everybody who did something wrong. But we are supposed to worship God with zeal, that we are supposed to have a fire about it. See, all of this in Malachi points to this right here, this one sentence. Worship is honoring the Lord by putting him first in all we say and do. Okay? Worship is honoring the Lord by putting him first in all we say and do. See, now that Jesus is here, okay, Jesus has come, we have grace, God's wrath has been satisfied, we have the chance to worship him in a way that is just, I mean, I'm thankful. Like again, the Old Testament was bloody. Who wants to do all that? So how do we put God first? How do we put the Lord first? Number one, by loving Him. By loving Him. Okay, the Bible says in 1 John, if you don't know God, you don't know love. And if you don't know love, you don't know God. So God obviously is love. Okay? But I love the way Jesus said it. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 22. He said in verse... Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You put God first by loving Him. See, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I had to figure out that I couldn't do what I was doing anymore. I couldn't follow the same pattern of life that I was going through. And so something had to change. I had to figure out what was wrong. And what was wrong was I had no Jesus in the mix. And when my heart changed and my heart softened and I knew that I loved the Lord, and I always had because I was brought up in church. I was raised in church. I'd always loved him. I had just never accepted him. And through that love of him, I accepted him and it changed my life. And so I started loving him and I started putting him first. So the first thing we do to show, to make God first, is we love Him. Second, second is worship Him. If you love Him, you're going to worship Him. Okay? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I love what the Apostle Paul says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Now let's stop right there for just a second. In view of God's mercy. Mercy is being saved from something you deserve. And what we deserve, according to what God's word, is hell. But God's mercy says, no. You accept my son Jesus into your life, you're saved from that. You're freed from that. Okay? So Paul says, because of that view right there, okay, because of that view in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. You see, right here, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to a first century Jew. What they would have heard was, give everything. Because if you go back to Leviticus, what we talked about with the law, every part of the animal was used. There was nothing left over. They gave everything when they sacrificed it. So when Paul says, in view of God's mercy and what he's done for you and what he saved you from, you give everything to him. That is your true and proper worship. When you accepted Christ into your life, you told him, I make you Lord and Savior of my life. That means you are giving everything to him. 
You are loving the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, and your mind. You love Him, and then you worship Him. Then, you're setting your mind on Him. Okay? You're setting your mind on Him. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and prep- by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Okay, now hold pause. Okay? Prayer focuses your mind on Him. When you enter into a time of prayer, you are focusing everything you have on Him. Okay? Even if we can't come up with the words to pray and the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and prays for us, we are still focused on Him. Okay? We love Him, we are worship Him, we are setting our mind on Him. And through prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, we present our request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Putting your mind on Christ first. I don't do this very well. There's times in my life where I get anxious or I get depressed or I get worry or I feel shame or guilt and my first thoughts are not of God. And what ends up happening is I end up becoming basically an Israelite of the Old Testament. Okay? Because if you look at the Old Testament and the Israel and the people of Israel, there's this pattern. And when everything is going great, that's when everything's actually not going great. Because when it's going great for them, they lose, they forget who God is. And they allow idols in. And they defile God's table with these, the second best of their sacrifices. And then all of a sudden, they're locked in sin, and God sends a nation or an army to come and to show them, hey, you're sinning. And then all of a sudden, we're like, we're like, we got to turn back to God. We're the same way. I know when things are going good for me, sometimes I lose my first thought of Him. Sometimes I'm not thinking about Him first. I'm not putting Him first. It's not until the proverbial hits the fan, then I'm starting to think about Him. Why is we as human beings do that? I want to strive to let my thoughts be of him first when things are good and when things are bad. I want to present myself to him as a living sacrifice, give him everything I am to love him and worship him. See, all this ties together. And then finally, when those three things happen, what's going on now is he's guiding your actions. Okay, I'm a huge fan of the word action in the Bible because what I'm not a fan of is just sitting in Bible study after Bible study after Bible study and learning and learning and learning and not doing anything with it. That would be like me going to college to learn how to weld and not going out and getting a welding job. It makes no sense. Why would we learn something and not use it? We let him guide our actions. In Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says it this way. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Now let's stop right there. Whatever you do. Now, 26, 27 years ago, I didn't wake up one morning and go, hey, I want to be a printing press operator. I'm going to go get a job at Color Press and I'm going to work there for 25 years. I didn't do that. I got a job there because I was told I would make enough money to raise my family, and I did. I didn't want to do it. It's not what I wanted to be. You want to know what I wanted to be? I wanted to be a detective for the district attorney. I wanted to be a police officer, work my way up to detective, and become a detective for a district attorney. That's what what I wanted to be growing up. 
Matter of fact, I got one year of Merced College under my belt in, in criminal justice to do that. But made a few mistakes, made a few wrong choices. God had other plans, but I didn't wake up wanting to be a preacher. I didn't wake up wanting to be a pastor. This was given to me by the Lord. And, but that 25 years at Color Press, that job that I didn't really want to do, it was probably three quarters of the way through that when I became a Christian at that place, and I figured out that, wait a minute, I, I don't think I'll ever do anything else. And, and Joel has said this a million times, it's funny how the Holy Spirit's voice sounds like your wife. <laughs> when I became a Christian, I got so upset because I wasn't going anywhere in the job. Yeah, I was a printing press operator, I was making great money. I'm not going to lie. It, it was great, buddy. But I wanted to be something else, and I wanted to be more. But I never let my heart and my attitude change. I never worked at it with all my heart. And look what the next line says. As working for the Lord. So if I'm working for the Lord and doing something, there should be an element of joy and peace in that. Because I'm working for Him. And I wasn't showing that. And she looked at me and she said these words, your situation is never going to change, Tony, until you figure out how to work with the joy of the Lord in the job you're doing now. Amen. When I figured out that I wanted to become a pastor, yeah, I'm going to tell you, this is not an easy thing to do. Finding joy in doing something you don't want to do goes against the very sinful nature of us human beings because we don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. But I had to figure out how to work as, I, as if I was working for the Lord, not for my human masters. Because it doesn't matter what job you're in, you're not working for your human masters. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're working for the Lord in everything that you do. Why? Because if you're a believer, you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. See, you can work in that job for a season, find your joy, and if God decides to open a door for you, he'll make it perfectly obvious. When I left Color Press in 2016, it was made perfectly obvious. I was called by a board member at Stone Ridge. I wanted to go be a maintenance guy for somebody else. They weren't, there, there was no application. As a matter of fact, the board member that called me, I had a conversation with him a year before that in 2015 and said, hey, you guys ever want a maintenance guy for the school? Give me a call. So guess what I figured out? Somewhere between 2015 and 2016 when he gave me that call, I found the joy of the Lord in my job. Because this board member called me up out of the blue. I didn't even know. I said, hey, you want a job? Packing my bags now. <laughs> June 1st, 2016, I left what was called, called Quad Graphics now after 25 years. Scary time for me and my wife. But I found the joy of the Lord in what I was doing. And that led me to here today to do what I'm doing for him now. And this is not to brag, not doing this to boast. If I'm boasting in anything, I'm boasting in what Jesus did for me between 2016 and 2023. Because it's all Him. It has nothing to do with me. But you work at it as though you're working for the Lord. Because in Malachi here today, loved ones, God deserves the worship and the glory and the honor from us. He deserves us loving Him, worshiping Him, setting our minds on Him, and letting Him guide our actions. See, here's the reason why, and let me end with this verse right here. Revelations 4, verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God. You. To receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things. And by your will they were created and have their 
being. I love that. Because Revelations, that verse in Revelations backs up what Isaiah says in, in chapter 43, verse 7, where it says, you were created for God's glory. You were actually given things to do before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 2.10 And we love Him and we worship Him. We set our mind on Him. And we let Him guide our actions. And we give Him all the praise and all the glory and all the honor because only He is worthy.